I'm happy to be here this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> it was a wonderful lunch. We had a wonderful lesson this morning and uh, had a good week this week. Uh, it was a blessing this week to receive encouragement from some of the other brethren as they listened to the sermon from last week. And, and uh, that was exciting and a blessing to me as well. All right, let me call your attention to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And beginning with verse 22. We're moving into a new subject. And uh, so that's kind of exciting. We are moving through the book, although slowly. But uh, this, is, this is exciting. I, I find as I read and I study it, it, I get excited about this stuff every week. And I hope you do too. Romans chapter 15, beginning with verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward toward you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go to Jerusalem, to minister unto the saints, for it hath, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come to you, by, uh, come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for, the Jerus for, for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints." that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for thy mercy upon us. Oh, Father, we are sinners, and we are in much need of thy mercy and of thy grace for each day. And, Father, that we might take up the things that are found in thy word we might be blessed by them strengthened by them that we might uh, uh, learn of these things that are recorded for us that we might imitate Christ and that we might show to the world that we are the children of the most high and saints in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and Father, I pray that you'll bless your word today, the preaching of it, that we might be encouraged in the faith of Jesus Christ. And I pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> we have now come to the end of the book of Romans proper. When we ended up with 21, that was the seal or the end of the book of Romans proper, which included practical applications as well as the theology that we needed to learn and what remains of the of chapter 15 and chapter 16 is an itinerary salutations a brief warning and a farewell now these are all sermons i'm going to preach but that's what's remaining for us in these next in, in the rest of this chapter and in verse 16 and what we have be, before us is paul's itinerary at least his intended itinerary or plans that he has made now i know that it's a temptation when we spent so many so long and i don't mean months i mean years preaching through the book of romans there's a temptation to move quickly 
do these last things and not to give them a lot of weight and a lot of thought after all paul says i'm going to go do this and then i plan on doing that and then i and then i plan on going here and i do need your prayers and sometimes we just briefly read through that and don't glean near as much as we ought to from it and i know there's a temptation as being so long in the book to just quickly move through it but we dare not do that lest we miss some nugget of gold something here at the end that will enrich us in spiritual things that will help us in our journeys in our itineraries and the things that we plan in this life and the surprises that this life sometimes brings us because there were things that came into Paul's life that were not as he had planned and we'll see a little bit of that and so this first we need to look at this and if the first chapter the introduction is of of such weight and importance so must also the salutation the closing the itinerary the last that is here why because it is a part of scripture and all scripture is given by inspiration is it not and it is all and it is profitable for doctrine for reproof for instruction so these things are they not even though they're at the very end of the book although there's salutations and although they're they're his his last words they have great weight that we ought to consider we shall find here an expression of great love that paul has for his fellow servants and workmen in the gospel ministry his plans for travel and the purpose of his going to jerusalem before going to spain and then to rome and if you think paul never made it to spain did he but he had intended it it was in his itinerary this morning we'll explore paul's itinerary from the present situation all the way to rome where his plans for rome all this is contingent on the will of the lord it is all contingent on the will of god do you know that at each hour in your day is contingent on the will of god every moment every hour is contingent on the will of god we could be having a great service here and then something fall through the roof and collapse the roof right i mean that might be a terrible thing to say but we could be terribly disrupted couldn't we suppose we had an earthquake and shook this uh, this uh, mobile home right off its foundation that would be a little bit of an interruption so every hour is by the grace of god and the will of god and we don't know what can happen from one moment to the next but we do plan and anticipate if by the will of god we should be able to do this to go as didn't, didn't james said we should say if the lord will we shall go into this city or that city and get gain so it is by the will of god not by our determination and our will but we still plan for those things that we will be doing or that we plan on doing all is contingent on the will of the lord paul was fully aware that the plans that he had made were not always the plans that the lord made for him he had plans but they always they weren't always what the lord had for him paul was flexible and realized that following the lord did not always mean he would be traveling a common road but was often detoured and detained in his endeavors i went to pick up my mother this morning and there was all sorts of road work and detours and changes and and the, i mean it doesn't look the same as it used to there they've got all sorts of things there so when we i brought her home we entered the freeway by a different route because the one that i had planned on was very crowded and traffic was backed up because three lanes were contained into one so we weren't going to go that way so there's a, a tr common road that we might take or plan on taking may have detours and we may be detained in our endeavors this was part of paul's ex experience in acts chapter 16 and verse 6 he says now when we had gone through uh 
Phrygia and the region of Galatia, we were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Paul had every intention to go to Asia. That was his plan. And when he had preached the word in the, uh, uh, of God, the gospel, as he was going along, they had intentions on going into Asia. And in verse 10 it says, And after he had seen a vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, gathering, uh, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. And we know that Paul had a dream of a man who said, who weighed and had, wanted him to come to Macedonia. And it was by the Lord that that came. And so he left off going to Asia. In fact, the scriptures say that the Lord prevented him from going into Asia. And he just turned and went into Macedonia instead. Because that was where God wanted him to go. Nevertheless, we learned the importance of planning. Planning is important in our life. Our dear brother Israel is planning for the ministry to the Spanish-speaking people. That's, that's what he feels that the Lord would have him to do. He's gathering psalm books and chairs and other things that he might need for the gospel ministry, and he is storing them at his house in anticipation. There is a planning here. He's seeking a wife who might become a helpmeet in this ministry. But I also know that he is flexible and knows that any instant the Lord can open up doors of ministry and service and change things that he was not anticipating. Amen. And we ought to be flexible about those things. Every preacher ought to be flexible about those things. And every congregant ought to be flexible about the will of the Lord in your life. Because I, I, preachers are not unique to the Lord changing things on you. The Lord may pick you up as a member of, the, of a church, of one of the Lord's churches, and move you. We ought to be flexible. A man cannot be fully given over to the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ without being flexible to the changes that the Lord might make in his ministry. You need to be flexible. Paul was flexible. He had an itinerary. He had a plan to go somewhere, but at any moment that could change. I have heard of people or known of people so set. This is what the Lord wanted them to do. And, and, they didn't get there because it really wasn't what the Lord wanted them to do. And they just gave up and quit along the way. First of all, I want us to note in verses 22 through 24, a finished chorus. Verse 22 and 23, he says, For which cause I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no more place in these parts... And having a great desire these many years to come unto you. And uh, I'm going to stop there. We have, we have a finished course. He's reached the end of a course. We'll see this. Last week we saw that Paul was a minister to the Gentile or to the heathen nations. To bring them to God. That was his purpose. That's what God had called him to do. To go to the Gentile nations and preach the word of God. In that ministry, he formed them as he went out. He made disciples. He followed the Great Commission, didn't he? He went out and he made disciples, teaching them, he baptizing them and teaching them all things that were delivered unto him of the ordinances, of church organization, of all of these things. And he constituted New Testament churches. And then as he was going, he would leave them. He would then leave men among this small group and then uh, establish elders in those churches. And they would all move on. There was a continuing ministry between Paul and then dropping off men along the way to help in these new churches that he formed. And so, in his ministry, he formed them into churches by which he served God in an acceptable way, worshiping in spirit and in truth. He engaged, his engagement in this ministry had been so occupying of his time that a visit to Rome, 
though desired, was to be secondary to the more pressing ministry before him. Now, he wanted to go to Rome. He kept up on the things that were going in Rome, on in Rome. He had reports that came from Rome during his time, and he desired to go and visit Rome. But he had more pressing issues. That is the ministry that God had set before him rather than to go to Rome. He says, but is written to whom? I'm sorry, wrong verse. Um, but now I have no more, it says, for which cause I also have been much hindered in coming unto you. In Romans 10, 1 through 10, it says, Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Paul desired to come unto the church at Rome. He wanted to have a prosperous journey. He says, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. He wanted to go to Rome. He desired to go to Rome. The ministry was pressing upon him, and he was ever stretching out and expanding into regions where the gospel was never heard to bring to light those that were in gross darkness. That was what Paul was doing. He was pressing on and going further and going further into these heathen areas to preach the gospel of Christ. So we see that he had a desire, and a desire, it, and in this desire, it was calling. It was a calling upon his heart and soul that hindered his coming to Rome. He says, "For which cause?" In our verse, "For which, for which cause I also have been much hindered from coming to you? For which cause, or wherefore, on this account, for this reason?" I haven't been able to come unto you. Now the word hindered, the word for hindered means to cut into. To impede one course by cutting off his way. So if I'm going this way and something comes in and gets in my way, I have to find another way, don't I? I was hindered from accomplishing something that I intended. And there was not a single occasion, it wasn't one thing that kept him from, from going to Rome, but rather there were many things that got in the way of his going to Rome. First of all, his desire to preach the gospel where it had not been preached. I don't know, I may have just gotten ahead in my sermon, but I'll go back and check my notes here. <laughs> the word is given... The word uh, hindered is given in the imperfect passive, meaning that many things arose in his life to keep him from coming to Rome. So it wasn't just one thing and then another thing. There was lots of things that came up in Paul's life that kept him from being able to go visit those people he wanted to visit. He had a sincere desire and a love for the churches at Rome, but he just could not stop doing what he was doing, just put down his work, go on furlough, and go to Rome. Paul didn't take a vacation. Now, I, I, I think vacations are something that preachers ought to take from time to time making sure that they've left in their church capable men to minister to the saints in their short absence. But Paul, remember, they didn't have airplanes that jetted them across the United States or from country to country or wherever in an hour or two hours or three hours. Didn't have that. But Paul didn't take a vacation. He couldn't stop what he was doing and say, listen, folks, I'm going to go visit the folks in Rome for a short time, and then I'll come back and pick up where I left off. He kept working. There was too much in front of him, too much work that needed to be done. 
and and going to Rome is is important to Paul, but he is unable to fulfill that desire because of the many things involved in the ministry hindering him. Now Paul, being led of the Spirit, could not give to a give in to a Roman trip because God had other places of ministry for Paul. Paul had other places he needed to be, not in Rome. Paul's ministry, in fact, his whole ministry plan did not include Rome. In other words, and we're going to see this, he had a couple things on mind. He says in verse 23, having a great desire these many years to come unto you. It was, but you see, his coming unto them wasn't going to be for any length of time. It was just a passing through, just a quick visit while he went somewhere else. One thing Paul did do is he did pray for them. He did pray for them. And he sent them a wonderful letter called the Book of Romans. He sent unto them this writing of, the, of great depth because the doctrine, the theology that is taught in the Book of Romans has great depth and very solid for believers to believe and they ought to study it to great depth. There's a lot of material in the Book of Romans. I've been preaching on it for over three years. There's a lot of work here. There's a lot of preaching to be done. And Paul just he, he, sent them, he sent them this letter, so he, 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 he loved them, he prayed for them, he said that he prayed for them. He sent them this letter to help them, to encourage them in the faith of Christ. He ministered to them even though he himself could not be there. Do you know that you can have ministries to others? even though you presently cannot be there. Maybe there's people that you would desire to go see, but you've been much hindered and not able to. Maybe you have a physical impairment that keeps you from going somewhere, or maybe that we don't have the funds to make a trip to go see somebody we'd love to go see. Yet we can minister to them of the things of God in prayer and in writing to them. Paul wrote, now I don't expect you to write an inspired scripture, but you can write to them of the inspired scriptures, and you can encourage them in the scriptures and in the faith of Jesus Christ. What an encouragement it is when I get an encouraging letter from another brother. And you too can be an encouragement to others by writing to them or calling them or encouraging them in the faith of Christ. And it might be that you have a burden for others, but you can't physically be there. But that does not mean that you do not have a ministry. I was sharing with you earlier the, uh, our, our sermons that we preached that are on sermon audio and how many people have listened to them just this month and, and we're right in the middle of the month. Many hundreds have. That's been a blessing to brothers and sisters in other countries and across this country that we wouldn't normally have an outreach to. And yet they are blessed by the ministry here of this little tiny dot in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. A word of encouragement to the pastor or brethren of a church praying for them and praying for the success of the gospel ministry, that you can do. There are ways we can be blessings to others. And what we do have, we have kind of an advantage. We have a bird's eye view because we have the scriptures before the, us. We know that Paul is going to go to Rome. We also know he's not going to go to Spain. But he didn't know that. He didn't know that. And we're able to see how God got Paul to Rome. Not the way he had planned on going to Rome. Plan Paul planned on going to Rome on his own schedule. No, God had a schedule for him as a prisoner to minister to the saints there. And for two years, 
Paul plan, Paul's plan for being in Rome was not for two years, maybe for two weeks. People often get the idea that the pastor has it, has it pretty easy. He's only employed in preaching a couple, three times a week. And how much time does it really need to prepare a Sunday sermon? Yeah, right? How about how? Listen, folks, and, and this is not bragging. I don't do that. But I'm just going to let you know this sermon that I've prepared, I have spent 17 hours editing, studying, preparing, and writing this out. How do I know that? Well, because it tells me on my program how much time I've spent on it. And it's going to take me about another three hours to preach it. So you figure there's at least 20 hours or more into this. Now, grant to you, I get to preach this for the next three or four Sundays because that's how long it's going to take me to preach it. But for your benefit. And in the meantime, I'm also working on other sermons. Not only have I spent time preparing for this and going through this three or four times this week, I, I wrote this six months ago, this sermon. And I'm trying to stay ahead, continuing to write and continuing to study, continuing to edit, and continuing to prepare a message for you whereby you can grow and be raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that you'll be sound in the faith of Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to put in the hours to deliver to you the gospel and truth of Jesus Christ. Being a good pastor requires a lot of work. I mean, why do you think that God had gave instructions to the church at Jerusalem for them to put deacons in the church? So the apostles could be given over to the word and prayer. So that the apostles wouldn't have to be concerned with all the daily routines and mundane work and the things going on in the church that needed to be attended to so they could spend their time in the Word of God and in prayer where the preacher's time ought to be spent. Too many preachers are spending their time trying to run their programs. Trying to make sure this is in a certain order. Now I have, I spent a... a Lori could tell you how much time I spent setting this up the chairs and setting up the the computer and the and the and the uh, camera and the mic and getting everything charged up, getting everything ready to go, making sure that everything is set so that it will be able to broadcast. And that takes time in my Sunday morning as well. But it has to be done. It is the work of the ministry, and I am glad to do it. You ought to pray for your preacher. He needs all the prayer he can get. And I appreciate what Brother Israel said this morning, that he had been pre praying for me all week. I'll take it. I've been praying for him too this week. I've been praying for all of you this week. Now, I'm not purposed this morning to give a referendum on the gospel ministry. But there are those who spend little time in study, whose preparation time is evident in shallow, short sermons. You know that I can't preach a sermon less than 45 minutes. Matter of fact, a lot of sermons, I don't even get through the introduction till 20, 30 minutes later. If that, sometimes I've taken up a whole time preaching up the introduction. Yet some of these men stand in pulpits and they barely have enough soap to preach for 20 minutes. That's a shame. 20, 25 minutes and, and there you go. Hope you're happy now. Most preach topical sermons that are more about moral living and we do need teachings on moral living from time to time but you know what I'd rather pull them right out of the context of the scripture as I'm going through and studying and preach them to you than to pick them out and then just make some kind of a topical sermon out of them something shallow where I spend a little time and study and preparation and it is evident by the shallowness of their sermons mostly how-to sermons and and step sermon you take this step then that step and then the next step and you'll end up being a good person at the end 
But those who truly love God's word and love the people to whom they minister will spend many hours in preparation and prayer so to deliver an accurate spiritual lesson to the people of God. I would say there are many men in pulpits that ought not to be there. And you can listen to their sermons. If you have any depth of soul and any understanding of the scripture, you'll listen to some of these preachers and you'll sit there and hold your hand in your head, your head in your hand, your head in your hand. I get it right here eventually. And just say, oh my, oh my, God help these people. These preachers will give up, you know, God's preachers, they'll give up their vacation and what might be considered, quote unquote, free time to complete some aspect of the work of their ministry. They got a work of the ministry. That's what God has employed them to do. I will give up my free time, my vacation time, so I can complete the task that God has set before me. You know, there's, there'll be time to rest after we die, right? Is that called the land of rest? Do we are we not going to is our bodies not going to rest in peace? <laughs> our rest is yet to come. Right now we're to labor in the things of God. They're often hindered or cut off by some occasion that keeps them from accomplishing their planned task. Important study, important study time might be interfered with some need among the membership, some, something that, that needs to be attended to, and so they must leave off their studies to go take care of that. And I'll tell you, to be honest with me, I get into my studies, and then if something interrupts or cuts in, I, I write off the rest of the day because it's already interrupted my thoughts and getting back to it is almost impossible to get there after I've been interrupted. Now, I, some preachers may not have that problem, but I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to disturb my thinking. <laughs> so I, I remember preachers when they were my age and, and I was just a youngster you know, in my 20s. And now I'm in their place as one of the old preachers. I was always a preacher boy. Not so anymore. The, uh, the, the former generation have died and have passed on and has left, left, left to us to continue with this ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ to teach the younger, the next generation of God called preachers the truth of God's word. And I wish we had a whole congregation full of preachers and send them forth into the harvest, into the gospel ministry. That's what I wish, right? A planned time with family might be hindered because of some task requiring the attention of the pastor that suddenly arises. The Lord brings many things into the life of his servants that may hinder our personal itinerary, but it is always for the glory of the Lord. That's one thing we ought to remember. Whatever, we may have a plan, we may have a desire. We might have an itinerary. And if it gets interrupted, don't worry about it. It's for God's glory. It's for His purpose. Isn't it? Tell me, what is it that is not for God's glory? I thought it was all for God's glory. Then we see that there is a finished ministry. I've been preaching for longer than I thought. I, I tried to keep my sermons down to about 45 minutes. And I think I've done gone there. Maybe. Not quite. A finished ministry. Notice what he says here. But having no more place in these parts. 
and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. But he says, but now having no more place in these parts. This is such an interesting statement. Uh, uh, having no more place in these parts. What, what does that mean? Well, Kenneth Weiss says the word place, that means opportunity, power, or an occasion for acting. So it was he'd been he filled up his ministry there. Vincent defines it as scope or opportunity. His opportunity or scope is finished in these parts, having no more place. It, it's done here. I've done the work that God sent me to do here. And I forgot where he was writing from, wherever he was at. There's several things that regulated the ministry of Paul. One, this is what Paul says, that he would go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his ministry. He was an apostle unto the Gentiles. That was one of his first criteria that he had when he went out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And where the gospel had not been preached... That's where he was intending to go. And second, that he would not build on the foundation of others. So Paul's work, his plan, his whole purpose, his, his uh, um, plan for his ministry was to go where the gospel had not been preached, to go to the heathen or to the Gentile nations, and not to build on another man's foundation where a man had already laid the foundation and then build upon it. He was going out doing pioneer work where no one else had gone before. Paul's travels were extensive. And not all of them are recorded for us in the Holy Scripture. There are some who say that Paul went as far as Wales, England. And they offer what proof they have, but it's not in the Scripture. And, there, and it might very well be so that he did. But Paul tells us he went into the country of Elycrium and preached the gospel, though we have no record of his travels in that part of the country. He is, he, we know that he preached the gospel everywhere, but we don't know what was accomplished in Elycrium. We don't know if churches were established. Then we have no record of what Paul did there. Now we know that when he went, he preached the gospel and he started churches. I don't doubt that he did it there, but we have no record of what he did do when he was there, just that he went. In his ministry, he planted churches in every place and ordained elders over them and charged them with the care that was required of the scripture. Other believers were coming into these areas. Other preachers and gifted apostles were ministering among the heathen. And the gospel was going into every corner of the earth. And when Paul would preach the gospel, and when he would establish a church, he would have other men come in and continue the work and build the work, and he would move on to the next work. It was not that there were no more places for him to preach. That's not what he was saying here. He could have stayed in this area and had some usefulness to these newly formed churches for the edifying of the church and the confirming them to the faith for the furtherance of their joy, uh, for the defense of the gospel and its ordinances among them. He could have stayed and had a continuing ministry. But he said, it's done here. I have done the work. There's no more place. I don't belong here anymore. It's filled up with the work that God had called me to do. And it was time to move on to other places where Christ was not so named, to plant churches. And this was accomplished, uh, th this had, had been accomplished in this region. And Paul begins to think of some other places, particularly Spain. Spain came to his mind 
where whereas they at the gospel was not preached and then perhaps to have some leisure to go to rome as the gospel had already been preached to the churches in rome they were already established churches in this capital city therefore he was going to visit them just visit them not do the gospel work that he'd been doing all along but to visit them to impart unto them you see he had a desire to impart unto you some spiritual gift not now some people get some funny ideas he's not talking about some extraordinary gifts to give to them but that of spiritual light or knowledge or peace or comfort as preachers do today when 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 invited to preach in another church paul was not finished with the gospel ministry he finished the uh, let me back up here a little bit when when a, a preacher is invited to a church he goes there to impart to them some spiritual gift some gift of, of, of a spiritual nature in the preaching of the word to deliver to the people of god that they might be encouraged and strengthened in the faith of jesus christ that's what he meant by spiritual gift Paul wasn't finished with the gospel ministry. He was only finished with that ministry in that part of the world. Now next Sunday I'm going to pick up with a new direction. Because it appears that Paul sets his eyes upon Spain. And we'll learn more about that next week. I hope this has been a blessing as we learn just these few things about Paul and his plans and his itinerary from where he is now to where he plans on going. Father, we thank you.